Hello, I'm Betty Elmer. Welcome to the Gravity FM Heritage Programme, which today is called A Tribute to RAF Spittlegate. In 1914, Grantham was a quiet agricultural town. The Great War, the war to end all wars, had started in August of that year. At that time, to see an aeroplane over Grantham was most unusual. After all, the Wright brothers in America had only made their first very short, very low manned flight in Kitty Hawk in December 1903. Therefore, when, at eleven o'clock on the morning of Sunday, the 31st of August, 1914, there was enormous excitement and interest when two planes belonging to the Royal Flying Corps flew over the town and landed on high ground known as Spittlegate Hill. It is known that the pilots went into town for something to eat and drink and after lunch took off and went south again. At that time, most of the training camps of the Royal Flying Corps were based in southern England and it was decided to develop more training camps further north where there was more space to do so. Local historian Malcolm Baxter speaks about the station's history. RF Spistiget was is where now is um, the Prince William of Gloucester Barracks at the top of Spittlegate Hill. It was there from late 1916 to the 30th of April 1975. Between that period, apart from two small periods of time in the early 1920s and the late 1930s, it was used as a training site for most of the RAF's pilots. Um, in late 1916, what was then the Royal Flying Corps, which was part of the Army, um, announced that Spittlegate was be used for training as an aerodrome for training pilots um, and it was to be built on the heathland which is now Prince William of Gloucester Barracks. Why there? It was a flat well-drained site but more importantly it was on the Lincolnshire edge which many aerodromes were at the time such as Waddington and it, it meant that as pilots took off they could go over the escarpment leading into Grantham and there was natural, uh, as the wind, westerly wind, thermals went up, gave them um, height and for trainee pilots that was a very uh, good bonus for them. It's often forgotten that in those early days more pilots, especially in training, were killed than were killed on the uh, western front. In fact the first two pilot two airmen killed in the First World War were killed as they took off from Salisbury Plain to go to France. One, the pilot was a Lieutenant Skeen and the air, airman, his passenger, was a man called Raymond Keith Barlow. Why I mention this is because Raymond Keith Barlow was from Grantham. His mother and grandparents lived on Wharf Road and he um, he was born in Grantham and he is now commemorated on the tablet memorial inside St Wolfram's Church. Anyway, that's just inside. So that's why um, they built it there. 49th Reserve Training Squadron was the first one to operate from Spurger and it was joined by 11th Reserve Squadron on the 4th of April 1917. These two squadrons left in September 17 and number 24 wing with three other squadrons took over. On the 1st of April 1918 the Royal Air Force was formed out of the Royal Flying Corps and the Navy's Royal Naval Air Service. Another thing that's often forgotten, the Royal Naval Air Service had the largest aerodrome in the country at one stage and this was known as HMAS Daldius. Daldius. In fact, we now know it as RAF Cranwell, so there's quite a lot of air activity in this area at that time. Another RAF station that is often forgot about was RAF Arlixton. Um, it was part of the same wing as Spittlegut and they, again it was used for training, although that soon closed down after the end of the war. 
In August 1918, a new unit at the 39 Training Depot Station was at um, Spitalgut and 40th TDS was at Harlixton. These became part of 24th Wing in charge of the, both the training depots and um, stations. So it was a, quite a hive of activity, as I said. Um, I knew a gentleman who had seen two planes come down on that site, around that area, in 1914. And he remarked to me that it was amazing. They were the first two aeroplanes that had been seen in Grantham. And within four years, it, there was that many aircraft you could hardly hear yourself think at one stage. Um, there were, like I say, there was coming from Arlixton, there was coming from Cranwall, and they were coming from Spitalgate itself. And it was a hive of activity. Quite a few crashes, a number of people were killed in them. Um, one of the most spectacular crashes was um, a training instructor and his pupil were out one day flying over Grantham. His power went, and fortunately the instructor was um, flying, and he managed to bring it down in um, St John's Vicarage Garden. Now it's a very small area, and very tight. Obviously at the time there's also Richard Ornsby's um, engineering works alongside it, so he must have brought it down on a postage stamp. Fortunately, very, well, the pilot injured his legs, and as he came down he narrowly avoided a baby's pram, in the vicarage and fortunately that in that was the future bishop of all earth sorry, melbourne in australia and he survived <laughs> fortunately for himself and melbourne but no he was very lucky to bring that down in what as he did it was fitting that cranwell should be known as raf daedalus as in greek mythology daedalus was the father of icarus the impetuous youth who, with his father, escaped from imprisonment in Crete by flying from a high tower on wings made from bird feathers stuck together with candle wax. Ignoring his father's instructions not to fly too near the sun, Icarus did just that. The wax melted, the feathers fluttered down, followed by Icarus, who plunged into the sea and was drowned. After the armistice on the 11th November 1918, um, 39 training depot um, station was closed and a number of frontline squadrons came and were disbanded at Spitalgut. On the 10th of November 1919, the third training group headquarters moved to Spitalgut. In the early 1920s, two bomber squadrons were based at Spitalgut. As I said earlier, at Mostly training squadrons were at Spitalgut, but for that small period in the uh, 1920s. Of these training squadrons, one was number 100, which had been brought back from Ireland, not from the Western Front, um, where it had been used in the war against Sinn Féin. But with the signing of the treaty in 1922, all RAF squadrons were removed from Southern Ireland, and as I said, number 100 squadron was brought to Grantham. In May 1922, it was announced that Spitalgate was now a permanent station of the Royal Air Force. As I said earlier, like with Arlington, many, many stations were closed down with the um, end of the war, but Spitalgate was kept on. Flying Training Centre was opened here in nine, uh, June 1922, as well as the bomber squadrons are already based there. In September 1925, three group was renumbered 23rd, 3rd um, group, and its new HQ was uh, St Vincent's. This is the first time St Vincent's was used by the Royal Air Force. On the 1st of March 1928, Spitalgut was renamed RAF Grantham. And prior to this, the two bomber squadrons had left the base, and on March the 2nd, 1928, Grantham reverted back to its training role with the formation of th number three flying training school. Um, a number of famous pilots were trained at um, Grantham. Geoffrey Quill, who was a well-known um, test pilot post-Second World War, he was trained at Grantham in 1933. Two famous names in the Battle of Britain, Stanford Tuck, who was in charge of a wing, and Sailor Milan, who was South African, they were both trained at Grantham. In fact, they were part of 1935 intake 
of whom, out of 32 pilots, eight survived the Second World War. In August 1937, um, number three flight training squadron, flying training squadron, moved to St. Cerny in Gloucestershire, and RAF Grantham was placed under the control of Bomber Command as part of number five group. Although in, 19, in September 1938, the Air Ministry decided Grantham was unsuitable as a bomber base. I could never understand why Grantham never had a concrete uh, um, runway, such as Waddington and all, many of the other um, Lincolnshire air bases. And if it had to add one, it would have become a um, Flan Lancasters, as all the others did later on. And I was talking to a lady one day, who was one of the first female uh, uh, quantity surveyors in the country, and she worked for the Air Ministry. And I asked her that question. I said, why wasn't Spilger, um made into a bomber, but every bomber base in the Second World War? And she said, basically, it was cost, and it was the A-52. They couldn't divert the A-52. It had been too costly to do that, um, because if you think, it dogs leg round, dog legs around the camp. Now we had the roundabout, but in those days it was just the road uh, junction, and so it was too expensive. So that's why um, Spilger always had a grass runway and never had a concrete runway, and so that's why it was kept on as a training base rather than as a heavy bomber base. The second of January, nineteen thirty-nine, the number twelve flying training school started initial training at Grantham. Pre-war, the airfield had gradually increased in size. For example, in nineteen twenty-nine. 140 acres to the north and east of the airfield had been purchased and I know before that another 80 acres had been um, so it's practically the size that we know the army camp is today. During World War II the grass runways were reinforced with mesh, um, mesh um, metal meshing to preserve the grass although this wasn't always ideal because the meshing broke up and made many punctures amongst the uh, aircraft taking off. During World War II, again, as I said, it was mainly used for training. Um, first off with initial training, and then later on in 43-44, it was used for advanced trainers. On the 11th of October 1941, there was the most spectacular collision, aerial collision at night. This was brought about um, when a German intruder, um, junk, a Junkers 88, piloted by Lieutenant Hans Hahn, was on the prowl waiting to attack a novice trainer on night training. It already um, brought down 12 other planes because on this same um, attack. Over Grantham he spotted an Oxford aircraft and as he attacked the two planes collided killing the three crew of the Junkers 88 and the instructor and pilot in the Oxford. Not known today, till even today, what happened, whether um, the, pilot, the German pilot miscalculated and collided, or whether the um, English crew actually, you know, attacked the um, German plane and collided with it. Late in World War II, at a time of great loss of life in the air, a fine British film called The Weight of the Stars was released. In this film, a poem called For Johnny was included. It was written by radio producer and scriptwriter called John Pudney. He scribbled it on the back of an envelope during a London air raid in 1941. Here it is, For Johnny. Do not despair, For Johnny, head in air. He sleeps as sound as Johnny underground. Fetch out no shroud for Johnny in the cloud, and keep your tears for him in after years. Better by far for Johnny the bright star to keep your head and see his children fed. On the 29th of March 1944, um, RAF Grantham was renamed RAF Spitzberger. This was because um, there was quite a few other bases around Grantham at the time and to avoid confusion it was decided to rename it as Spitalgut. The main base around here was the RAF Regiment, one at Alma Park, and I think this is where the confusion was beginning to occur. 
because of the heavy use during the war, um, the airfield was put on care and maintenance for a short period for repair and, and um, everything. Although it was still continued right up until the end of the war and after as a training. In, on October, sorry, 18th of February 1948, the last powered flying aircraft left. And from then on, various non-flying uses were made of the base, including the RAF Officer Cadet Training Unit from 1948 to 1954, the RAF School of Education was there in 1954 and the RAF Central Library. Unfortunately, I wish I'd known, even though I was only about three, I'd have been there. <laughs> and in 1959, the Secretarial Officers School and H the headquarters of Number 3 Police District were stationed there. On the 10th of October, uh, sorry, 10th of July 1952, the base was granted the freedom of the Borough of Grantham which meant they could march through the, boroughs, the streets of Gantham on ceremonial occasions with bayonets fixed, colours flying, drums beating and bands playing. I love that. I think that it's so evocative. And that was, that was written on the Freedom of the Borough's um, parchment. In 1960, RAF spit a woman commander because it became the, training, the initial training depot for the Women's Royal Air Force. And then in October, which it remained until it shut down in 1975. From October 1975, number two gliding centre and 64 gliding school um, was at Grantham, at Spitalgate. I remember I was a cadet at the King's School and many local cadets, RAF cadets, gained their initial experience of flying at Spitalgate on gliders. And in fact, it might sound strange, you know, I find it difficult to recollect, but some of the gliders were actually um, set off in the air with big rubber bands, which the cadets got on one end of um, both sides of and sent the air, um, glider into the air. It takes a lot to imagine that, and I'm still finding it difficult that I remember that. By March 1975, both the RAF's uh, Women's Royal Air Force and the gliders had moved from Spitalgate. The gliders went to Syston, where they still the Central Flying School um, glider school still is. And on the 30th of April 1975, it was formally handed to the army and became Prince William of Gloucester Barracks. It should be noted that for many years, the area of the town near the airfield was known as Spitalgate, spelled S P I T T L E. G A T E. On the 29th of March 1944, RAF Grantham was renamed RAF Spitalgate, spelled S P I T A L G A T E. It is thought that an Air Ministry typist misspelled the old version of S P I T T T L E G A T E as S P I T A L G A T E, on the order that went out from the Air Ministry, and the mistake was never corrected. Now, as a little lad, Brian Reynolds lived on the base. Me and my father and the family moved into Spitalgate in 1968. Then days we didn't have any gas fires or anything in there, but it was a nice view over the Grantham. He actually worked on the gliders up there, make, mending them when the youth used to crash them into the ground, which used to be fun sometimes. He was also used to be a photographer up there. And he used to take photographs of all the young lady wafts that came through there. And as a ten-year-old, seeing a load of young ladies coming through was a, was a dream for a young lad. We used to come out on, on a Thursday when they passed out when we was off school just to watch them pass out and everything like that. And we used to really enjoy ourselves. But he also said mended gliders and I actually had a chance to go up in one over Spitalgate. And when you're up there, it's a fantastic view of what you could actually see. And I can remember one time having bonfires up there on bonfire night and great big displays and stuff. I mean, it was cold, admittedly. I can also remember times, what you don't see nowadays, is snow fences around to keep the snow off the road 
on the airfield and about. You know, when I first saw him, I asked my dad what they were, and he goes, they're snow pinches. He can't stop snow like that. And he explained to me that it just put snow piled up against it and stopped the snow going on the road. Which, in the, nowadays, I can see how it happened and how it worked. But when you're young, you don't think of it like that, making snowball fights and things. But, I say, it was quite a good time up there. Uh... I enjoyed myself up there. It was one of the experiences I wouldn't gave up at all. When I lived up there, I lived. I went to school at St Anne's Primary School, which was an old building in Grantham. Then I moved from there. I went to the Boy Central School, which is now the Little Gunnaby School. Where I spent the whole five years there, which I fully enjoyed all the education. The houses, there were terraced houses. You could either have a two-bedroom or three-bedroom house up there. They had no central heating, or the heating you had was a coal fire and an immersion heater. And if your fire went out and the coal, and you, you, all the coal went out, it was cold up there. You, you definitely know when the wind came round. Mum used to do some of her shopping in, on the base. A little naffy shop up there, but the main shop, we used to come into Grantham. The, the main shop for the week. In them days, it was not so busy as it is now. The town has changed a lot. But it was nice. We, regular bus service. You could walk, it's in walking distance as well, but regular bus service down into town, you get your shopping and come back. And there's lots of things on the base that you wouldn't think there would be. The WAFs which is the Women's Air Force, there was all abilities up there and there's a, there was a full medical facilities up there for them as well, which the families could use. And there was lots of activities going on, basketball, netball and stuff. They used to co cooperate with RF Cranwell to go swimming and they used to have dances every week for the recruits to go together, which was held on a Thursday, which was quite a nice thing for them to do, especially when there's not a lot around in them days. Nora English worked as a driver at the base during World War II. I joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force in 1942, during the war, of course, and after training at Morecambe as an MT driver, I was um, came on leave and was told to proceed by rail, taking my own food for the journey to RAF Spitalgate, which was only a Tupney bus ride away. Having got there, I was asked if I would like to live out on a compassionate sleeping outpost, but I didn't really want to be at Spitalgate, so I said, no, I'd rather stay on camp. The conditions for the WAF at that time were pretty horrible. We were built in the old married quarters that were attached to the station. There were three rooms to each billet. There were three girls to each room. With no hot water, if you wanted a bath, you had to ladle water into a copper outside and put a coal fire under it. We only had one sack of coal for the three rooms for a week, so nobody very often had a bath. If you did, it was a cold one. While we were there, it was very nice. It was a training camp. But things did happen entirely what you didn't expect to happen occasionally. The very first time I was sent off to Harlixton because we were flying there, I couldn't find Harlixton Aerodrome. Now, Harlixton was the night flying station from Spitalgate. And every day, a staff and air crew went out to Harlixton to fly, and they're very, very busy doing this. I wasn't over keen on that job, but anyway, uh, Kate, we uh, also did all sorts of manner of jobs at Spitalgate. I can remember being on fetching rations. You, you, you drove a, you drive an officer about one day, and the next day you'd be on the coal cart. But it was very interesting, and I loved every minute of it. At Spitalgate, Eventually, 
they started a, what was called a bat flight, and that was beam approach training. That meant that aircraft were going to learn to fly at night by radar, and they wouldn't need to have people flashing lights at them from the ground or talking them down. That was extremely good. And for one week, I was on duty at bat flight, just driving an officer about, who never spoke to me, actually, but still. Eventually, I was sent to be at Harlixton permanently as a 24 hours on, 24 hours off driver for the commanding officer. Our jobs were very, very odd. We'd get rather nice jobs, and I can remember one night being told to get uh, my vehicle out to cart about a hundred and something blankets from one billet to another about three o'clock in the morning. I don't know why it had to be at such a time. I stayed there driving at Harlixton with another girl on the other 24 hours that I wasn't working until the camp moved. And that, I'm not quite sure what I think it would be about 19... 19- 44, 45, when the whole camp moved to RAF Hickson in Staffordshire. The, the other WAF driver and me were sent on our own in the van with no sides in the snow to make our own way without a map to this new place. At Spitalgate, I eventually became a what they called a leading aircraft woman. That meant I'd gone through three lots of ranks without any terrible troubles and I'd managed to keep driving to a good standard and my and my behaviour to a good standard. <laughs> but it was a it was a fairly strict camp when I was there because after all it was a training camp. But we did get a lot of excitement I can remember going to a Harlixton in an ambulance one morning to be on ambulance duty for flying at Harlixton and there'd been a crash at not very far to a few fields away from RAF Harlixton. I was I didn't know quite what to do and they said drive through the hedge, through the field and find where this crash is. So off a turtle to cross the fields through hedges. I'd got a a Ford some thirty hundred weight lorry, I believe, at the time, and eventually found the, found the crash. It was a Wellington bomber with five Canadians on board. Everyone was alive. Everyone was saved. And quite a lot of months later, they came to thank us for what we did from RAF Spittergate. Another day, I was just coming off duty. And I was told I needed on that there'd been a crash at Ropsley. So I'd got to take RAF officers out to this crash. And apparently two aircraft had bumped into each other in the sky. So off I went there. On the way, my officer said, when you get there, I want you to circle round the field and park your car dead opposite, looking away from the, where the crash is. So I said, why? So he said, I want you to take me back to Spitalgate at the end, not, not me take you. <laughs> and I understand that it was rather terrible to see. We used to get ma- many duties as drivers. You took a, a turn at everything. Salvage, um, officer training, staff car duties, funerals. It was all very interesting. And, and many of the time I've gone down to the, uh, the station at Grantham to collect aircraft engines, believe it or not, which were dumped on my low flat lorry that I had at the time and taken back to Spitalgate. It's, it's really rather amazing that uh, I thought what an important job it was. <laughs> Eventually, when the Americans came, they came to Harlixton, but not to Spitalgate. And all the RAF and WAF people there, had it was very, very basic. There was no water laid on. There were no water lavatories. There was nothing of any um, modern things at all. But as soon as the Americans came, 
things changed. They not only changed it for themselves, for their for their huts and and living quarters, they changed it for us as well. So we're all good. It spread to us as well. It wasn't just for them as well. The first Christmas they were there, we were told we'd have turkey for Christmas dinner. The Americans had bully beef because their turkeys hadn't arrived. And so we've got better food than what they did at that time. <laughs> at RAF Spitgate, the airmen, the pilots who had been trained at Cranwell to just fly a, a plane, were sent to Spitgate to train ready for warfare and they left us and went to various squadrons as fighter pilots, bomber crew and all sorts of of flying duties. We also had officers who had flown so many sorties over Germany and were due for a bit of a rest, were sent to RAF Spitalgate to train the new pilots because they could give them really let them know exactly what they were letting themselves in for because they'd experienced it. On the very, very rare occasion, they lost their lives with their pupils because things did happen. Also from Spittergate, because they didn't want us to be bombed, I believe one or two bombs were dropped on the very edge during the war time, but nothing right that hit us dead on. But we used to have a thing called Q-Site. This was a, a decoy aerodrome. There were two or three around Grantham because there were a lot of aer- aerodromes around Grantham. These Q-Sites were to fool the Germans that they thought it was, they were going to bomb an, an aerodrome because the flares were lit on the, to make it look like a, a flare path, a, a runway. And they hoped that they, and occasionally, I think it did work. They were bombed, and it saved Spitalgate, of course, from being bombed. At the Q sites, there was usually, well, it was one man on duty at a time, so there would be probably two men living in this hut. And every night, round about tea time usually, they had to go and set paraffin flares down, making it look like a runway, so that it looked as if it really was an aircraft place, although there was no aircraft there to fly. Also, at at RAF Harlixton, every night, we used to have a little man used to come in the vehicle with us across the airfield with an officer who would decide which direction the runways were to be, and flares were lit to make it look like a runway. For our, and that is how, how our aircraft landed. They used to do a lot of circuit and bumps uh, at Spitalgate, which was quite a laugh because even now when I see an aircraft, I often think of circuits and bumps. They sort of land, but they don't stay land. They take off straight away, which was good practice for them. Um, at Spitalgate... The pilots were trained with Andersons, Oxfords and Blenheims mostly. They were sort of smaller planes, of course, than the uh, real bombers. Of course, our camp wasn't... We couldn't, we couldn't have flown bigger planes because the airways would not have been big enough or wide enough or long enough for them. Then also, the, the boys that were, when they came to flying at, Har- at Spitalgate, were also sent out to Harlixton to do night flying. So where they did their night flying was always at Harlixton. At Harlixton, all of a sudden, we were taken over by the Americans arriving. They didn't fly from Harlixton very much at all, but, but one or two of their officers had their own planes, Tiger Moths mostly. They were very good. There was only, really, one or two wafts out at Harlixton. There were what they called the wireless girls, but they were taken by vehicle from Spitalgate to flying control at Harlixton and were, um, did their job there and probably 
take them down to the cookhouse for a meal and take them back. But there was only the commanding officer of Horlickston's um, orderly and me as wafts sort of loose on the camp. Must say that we were treated with great respect by the Americans, although they had very queer ideas on driving because every now and then they forgot that we should be on the left-hand side of the road and not on the right. And on the whole, they were extremely courteous and, well, I suppose that they were a long way away from home and I suppose that they never, th- they never thought of been any other, I suppose. They weren't there all that long because they were eventually posted to Ascot. So we didn't have all that wonderful time, time with them. Although while they were here, it was very nice. Whilst I was at Harlixton, there was virtually no fraternisation between the Americans and the WAFs. Matter of fact, there wasn't a lot of fraternisation between the Americans and the RAF. They were tolerated each other and everything else was their their idea of of um discipline was a lot different to ours. We were I mean an officer would not sit down at a meal in a in a restaurant with a, another rank. But an American officer would. It wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. But I suppose time has did change, perhaps when the war finished, I don't know. I can remember taking this American of mine to Nottingham. Well, he was taking me, at least, to Nottingham for a day out. And uh, we went in the King's Restaurant there, because it was about the only place I knew. And we sat at a table with a... I turned out to be an RAF, and of course I was in RAF uniform. And this officer asked if he could either move them to another table or move us, because I was of the ranks. <laughs> In his younger days, radio presenter Alan Matzel worked at Radio Spittlegate. Unknown to many local folk, Gravity FM wasn't the first community radio station in Grantham, as another station existed here as far back as the mid-60s, although not on FM. Like many of the larger Royal Air Force bases, Spittlegate had its own radio station, Radio Spittlegate. Its primary purpose was to keep the Women's Royal Air Force new recruits entertained during their six weeks of basic training that introduced them to service life. It was also a good medium for families of the recruits to send messages and request music tracks for their absent daughters. As many of the young women were away from home for the first time, Radio Spittlegate was a friend in the many off-duty hours spent in the accommodation blocks. The audience changed every six weeks or so as new recruits arrived and the previous trainees departed to other bases to learn advanced skills such as air traffic control. As a civilian when I joined the station, it was necessary to sign in and out at the guardhouse every time, which still exists today. I was one of the the very few civilians working on an RAF radio station and was the youngest disc jockey to broadcast on the network. The station manager held the rank of flying officer and is one of the few stations I worked on where the DJs addressed the station manager as sir. The radio station itself was in the admin block that overlooked the parade ground. The studio itself was some five metres square and divided in half by a tall shelving unit which housed the extensive record library. The other half was the DJ's workstation which consisted of a very basic Trix mixer with rotary faders, two record decks and the microphone. The tracks were queued up, ready to broadcast with a turntable slip mat spinning underneath the disc, which provided the instant start needed for the track. There were certainly no computers to help the DJs in those days. The audience consisted of some 600 young women, mostly teenagers, and the station's format was a very BBC middle-of-the-road style, with artists such as Andy Williams and Ray Conniff. My rival saw a much more upbeat content, presented in the style of the pop pirates such as Radio Caroline and Radio London. The playlists were mostly soul and Motown tracks, previously rarely played on the station, and became a popular fixture on the schedule every Monday night between 8 and 10 p.m., which the recruits called Bull Night, as this was the evening when all of the cleaning and tidying tasks were to be done to the sound of the Supremes, Sam and Dave, and Otis Redding. 
Requests were often received on scribbled notes through the studio's side window, as well as via the telephone system and letters from parents and relatives. At 10 o'clock, I would wish the audience a very good night, switch the base's audio system to the BBC in time for the Greenwich Time signal, turn the lights off and lock the station up for the night. Last job would be to call at the guardhouse to hand in the keys, ready for the next broadcaster at 6pm the next day. Sadly, Radio Spitalgate is no more, but was a great opportunity for many to put into practice the skills needed as a radio DJ and a British Forces Service broadcaster, BFBS, and for some, a future career in local radio. One of the young WAF trainees to whom Alan was broadcasting was Vicky Leeson. My name's Vicky Leeson, and when I was 17, I joined the Air Force because my sister was already in there. Uh, I went to RAF Spitalgate on the 12th of October 1962. And because I wanted to be a telephonist and to be stationed near where my sister was. We spent six weeks at Spitalgate doing all our square bashing. We were taught how to march, how to make um, those awful bed packs. And every morning after we'd been sworn in, we'd have to make a bed stack, fold all our sheets around the pillows and around the blankets. Um... I'd know every morning, I think we had to get up about half past six uh, for breakfast. We were given a knife, a fork and a tin mug and that had to be taken with us each meal mealtime. Uh, while we were there, we were told to choose what kind of career we wanted to be in and I wanted to be a telephonist. So they gave us all sorts of aptitude test to see whether you could do what you wanted to do but I was accepted to be a telephonist so after the six weeks training at Spitalgate I went to RAF Compton Bassett to train to be a telephonist. At Spitalgate we were given two uniforms, one was called a best blue and one was the working set that we had and one of those very great heavy great coats. Um, we were also given a sum of cash. I can't remember how much it was, but we had to be sent down to Marks and Spencers to buy three pair of pyjamas, three vests, three pair of pants, three pairs of everything, three t- no, towels they gave us. Um, and every morning we had to lay all our kit out including what we'd been given to buy um, on the bed for inspection. Uh, we were given our uniforms, so then we had to start the polishing of all the buttons and the badges and uh, everything else you have to do. And march, every day we were marching on the parade square up and down. I remember while we were at Spitalgate a film crew came down, I think it was the Pathé News, and they did a short film, and we were called Girls of the Air. And they interviewed, I wasn't one interviewed, but they interviewed a few of us from our section. We spent most of our evenings in the Naffy, because it was too far to walk into Grantham. Some girls did, but I wasn't among them. After Spitalgate, um, I went to do my training at RAF Compton Bassett uh, and there you were taught how to find where any cause and I was given one number to find and it took me two hours and I never did find it because I was sent to look for the British European underground airways and it took me two hours to realise that there wasn't any such place. After Compton Bassett I went to Bomber Command High Wycombe and we had some fun there and one of the, I worked on the Underground Operations Board and one evening while I was there a call came through to say that Kennedy had been shot. I just screamed and the RAF, the ops officer, came straight in, so I didn't even have to transfer it to his room. He heard me scream and came in. Um, and that was the night Kennedy was shot. I remember one time at um, 
bomber command we were on the switchboard a number of us girls about 12 of us i think in all and if ever anybody important rang through it was 99 times out of 100 always their pas but this one day i got this telephone call through said this is the duke of edinburgh and i'd like to speak to the cnc and i just flippantly answered yes okay and i'm mary queen of scots and put the call through and then afterwards, the supervisor came to me and said, took me away for a big reprimand, because it was the Duke of Edinburgh that I was speaking to. While we were at Spitalgate, um, we were asked what we were going to do with our wages when we were given them. And some people obviously had to send cash back to their parents, their home places. But the discipline was such that we were told we had to save at least five pound out of what we were given and more or less made I think to open a bank account so that it taught us how to I suppose value our money. Um, the discipline was hard, it was well structured, I liked it because I liked the security and the safety of it. Um, You've got to be in at a certain time, do such and such a certain time and be ready for anything at a certain time. Uh, so discipline was hard but good. My service number while I was at Spitalgate, I still remember even now, and it was K2839564. I was SACW when I left the Air Force. That means senior aircraftswoman. Although RAF Spitalgate closed in 1975, there still remains a link with the Royal Air Force. Andrew McRae. For some years now, the, the Royal Air Forces Association and its Grantham branch have met together socially at the what is now the Prince William of Gloucester Barracks, of course. It used to be RAF Spitalgate. And we meet there once a month and uh, just have a generally a social occasion. We have between 10 and 15 people there perhaps and we have speakers along giving us talks on what's going on in the RAF at the present time. We sometimes have our Royal Air Forces liaison officer, that's somebody who is a serving officer who joins us and keeps us up to date with what's going on in the RAF. But generally it's a social meeting and the RAF is involved throughout the town and normally generally collecting for the RAF Benevolent Fund and the RAF Association Funds. So we've got plenty to keep us going, but uh, sadly the number of volunteers, of course, is reducing over the years. But it's still well worth a good organisation to belong to. You are listening to 97.2 Gravity FM. I'm Betty Elmer, and this has been a tribute to RAF Spitalgate. I send my grateful thanks to everyone who participated in the programme. Visit our website, gravityfm.net. Local radio for local people. On Gravity FM. <laughs>